In just a moment. Okay, so I'm going to be stepping in here for our moderator. I was just remarking to the panel, if you wish to be a moderator at our event, uh, we greatly welcome you. Uh, please submit your name. However, there is one requirement, which is you have to come. Don't come. You aren't invited back. That's the rule. Okay. So that being said, um, let's uh, have our panelists introduce themselves, and then we'll get into the topic. So I'm Sean Freeman I'm with Pandango. We're the leading provider of smartphone content, uh, primarily applications. Um, we uh, support all the major smartphone platforms um, and sell content both here in the US and abroad. Okay. My name is Dan Offner. Um, I'm the co-head of the interactive entertainment um, me media team at Nixon Peabody. We represent uh, technology companies, uh, content providers, content aggregators in this space, and um, I'm going to hopefully provide some uh, colorful scar tissue war stories. Chris Brunner with Univision Communications, and uh, we're the fifth largest media company in the U.S. focusing on the, the Hispanic population, Spanish-speaking population, and we sell content throughout the U.S. and Latin America. Uh, Joe Lameron, um, work with MBlocks. Uh, we are the uh, largest global provider of SMS and premium SMS services, uh, providing uh, transport, delivery, uh, uh, billing, and settlement. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Faraz Saeed. I'm the CEO of uh, Mobile Complete. We are the leading provider of test, monitoring, and uh, demonstration solutions focused on the mobile uh, content provider market. Okay, good. So um, we're going to. Uh, we're going to uh, slightly change the focus here uh, of the panel. Uh, we're going to not just talk about selling to the Americans, we're also going to talk about American selling abroad as well, which I think will include the entire audience. Uh, if you're just focused on a domestic market or a foreign market, you're missing a big portion of your potential revenue. Uh, and we're going to make this a little bit more of a how-to kind of um, panel than previous ones. Um, uh, and we're be practical here, which is always helpful. So we're not talking about some um, about the future here. We're talking about very much about the present and, and doing business and practices and so forth. Um, I think the central question, which has come over, uh, come up over and over again at this conference, and frankly, practically every conference, uh, mobile entertainment summit we've done the last ten times, is we have a closed market here still, uh, very tightly guarded gates on the part of the carriers. Uh, it's frustrating, to say the least, on the part of uh, foreign uh, companies who are much more used to open markets abroad. So the question is, when and how does this change? But uh, more importantly, for the purposes of the president, how do you deal with the current situation? How do you get into the American market as a foreign company if you uh, and deal with these rules at the same time? So who wants to take a, a stab at that? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, looking, you know, looking toward more of the uh, off-deck market, really, um, where uh, Mblocks will be working with a lot of their clients, um, the challenges really come into every market has its guidelines of uh, kind of protocol of what the carriers expect. Um, and so within the U.S. market itself, uh, the challenges really become a, a, an issue of just understanding the, you know, what, what a campaign is, you know, what a campaign is acceptable. Uh, then you 
through approvals, uh, provisioning, certification. Uh, timelines, you know, can be up to you know, six to eight weeks. Um, so it's really a learning curve of understanding what the carriers are going to accept, uh, you know, and the abilities of working within those guidelines really are the challenges uh, that, you know, kind of create an obstacle sometimes uh, and a barrier of entry. Mm hmm Okay. Who else? Dan, that sounds like your, your well, area. I would have all the time. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that the challenge with anybody who is a content creator that wants to put out content into the marketplace today, um, and, it's, and, and they think that you know, it's a downloadable universe, and if they just float out some pictures of Paris Hilton, that they can make a lot of money is that while Paris Hilton might be a wonderful brand and she might drive a lot of people to want a wallpaper or a ringtone with Paris saying something, that getting from the headshot to the download involves all those different steps. And at each step along the way in the ecosystem, in the value chain, um, for better or for worse, there's an agreement that a lawyer's looked at, and there's also a cost associated with it. And so I think what hopefully will change economically as we move away from a walled garden is a more vibrant content, data-rich data um, environment. But it's, it certainly has changed from being carriers sort of taking everybody who would pop up to now really the aggregators being the, the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. yeah. A little bit more about going on deck, and I think in today's market, at least in the U.S., if you're not, um, if you don't have um, unique or close relationships with the guys that run the different verticals within the carriers, if you don't have a big brand, if you don't have some uh, compelling content and you're coming from overseas, I, mean, I have I probably take five meetings a month with companies from Latin America or Europe or Asia. They're trying to get into the U.S. market and they can't. They've got great content. So I think you're you've got two strategies. You either go out and hire somebody that's got relationships in the marketplace, or you partner with somebody in the marketplace already and gain distribution. Um, maybe as a Trojan horse, get in with some of your content on their applications and start to prove yourself. And uh, and then you can spin it out from there, but it's it's incredibly challenging, and, and uh, you know, fortunate or unfortunately, on deck is still the primary driver of revenue right now in the U.S. Yeah. Right, with a few with you a few exceptions, T-Mobile, I guess, is probably the the most open at this point. I mean, is it? Do you guys have a sense that the uh, on the part of the carriers that this um, situation is changing, that the on deck environment um, is beginning to become more porous? Well, um, let me address that. Um, we, uh, we are not getting that impression. In fact, uh, uh, just to add to uh, what Chris mentioned here, uh, that once you have compelling content, you can cut a deal, then there are all these other barriers that you still have to pass through that Joe pointed out, which is testing and certification and getting and everything. And what we are seeing in the market is that uh, the carriers are getting more and more stringent because there are more content providers and there are more people using these apps and content and the carriers are putting more gateways of um, uh, quality in place so that uh, you know when they deliver uh, content uh, the the consumer isn't affected adversely yeah, actually mm -hmm. just adding to that I mean that really the carriers are are now starting to hone in both on an on deck and off deck environment to try to sure that commute, uh, consumer experience is, you know, representative of their network, and, and so it's become really more important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, our experience has been that um, it seems to be, uh, we're now, we're obviously focused more in the application space, but uh, our sense has been that there's actually been increasing carrier focus on, on that kind of content and making sure that kind of content, maybe not within the, within the confines of the walled garden, but certainly still stays branded by them consumer experience is owned by them. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, what is, this, this question has come up a few times, what is the advantage or the disadvantage of just saying, well, to hell with it, and just basically getting on WAP, and, and especially if you have other media properties, using them to promote uh, what you have and just leaving the carriers out of the picture entirely? Uh, how dangerous uh, is it to do that? Um, are you cutting off your nose? If
But what's uh, you, you need a big bank account. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And you yeah. need a real brand. Media, yeah. media becomes the, the big hurdle there, and so, uh, you know, WAP is still relatively, uh, you know, unproven in my mind. I mean, it's still something that we're starting to see some good traction in it, but um, direct-to-consumer, premium SMS, that type of stuff, it's a great marketplace, and for those that have media and TV, especially TV, um, can build a solid business off of, off of it with subscription models, but you need a big bankroll to be able to do that. or own a media company. Is that, uh, is anybody doing that uh, successfully right now? MTV is, B yeah. BET is, we're, we are about to get very aggressive in the next few months with it, so because we've seen the model play out, we've seen that the subscription-based services actually have, you know, we were in, a, we were in a, a stretch where we would run a bunch of media and we'd see our subscribers go up and then we'd pull the media back and they'd all fall off and, you know, we, it was kind of like, we, where were we supposed where we're utilizing our, our CPMs as best as we could on our, on our media, and we decided we weren't. So once the subscription-based models came in for direct-to-consumer, um, we're now going to be throwing you know, millions and millions of dedicated media at, at off-deck. So I, I, think that, I think it is shifting. I think it's moving away from on-deck as more and more media companies start to see better models, business models that allow them to make real money in the space. You'll start to see a lot of uh, the major media companies and the labels and everybody else go after the direct-to-consumer market uh, much more. Yeah. Now, can the uh, carriers in any way, I always hear people always talk mysteriously about the terrible things carriers could do to you um, if you if you are uh, bold enough to do this uh, or foolish enough to do this. But no one exactly ever tells me what the carriers might do. Um, I mean, is there anything to be concerned about in, in pursuing a, a strategy like this? Um, I, I, I don't think there really is a... As, as it may have sound you know, in, the, in the past. I think the carriers have sort of embraced because they're seeing their off-deck uh, business grow. Um, and at the same time, it sort of at times complements the on-deck environment. So I, I don't see that as, as much of a fear factor. I think, you know, I, again, it actually just kind of goes full circle. The reason why in the off-deck environments you're starting to see the carriers focus more on the quality that's hitting those handsets because both of off deck is now starting to be a number that they're starting to slowly notice. Right. So I, I don't think there is really a conflict of nature, really. So there's no longer a, there's no, no longer an outright hostility to it. It's just the it, it's they're a little slow on the uptake. I, th I think if you look at the carrier models, messaging is driving their ARPU, and so if you go through the messaging team, you're going to get all the support you need from the carriers. Um, you know, you might have to avoid the data team so you don't get shot, but in the end, the message team is the messaging team is you know can drive. Deck strategy is without any issues. That's interesting. So, in other words, short text is um, yes. is a very very lucrative way to go. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, if you see the you know the uptick that's been going on, and a lot of this a lot of this is you know happened in the last two years, mm -hmm. that you're starting to finally see you know that there is a model that the carriers are enjoying. I mean, if there's anything that's still you know in a barrier sort of situation, is you know there's still going to be some control kind of bases around you know game what of a challenge because of the user interfacing on an off-deck environment, um, you know, things of that sort. Or, you know, as we know that advertising now, and these models are starting to come out, those are still going to be t tightly, you know, closely held by the carrier side until they really understand that ecosystem. Um, you know, it's sort of what happened with SMS messaging and how it's now grown in the last two years. Now, one thing that I find kind of interesting, um, and it fits with the last, um, Panel, this idea of making uh, MVNOs ever more granular, uh, granular, granular. I'm, I'm English challenged today, um, and the idea of bringing it down actually to the level of individual families or associations. Um, something that a few years ago, as recently as six months ago, I would have heard completely poo-pooed. I mean, the conventional wisdom being that you had to have uh, a customer base uh, in the uh, hundreds of thousands and be willing to spend millions of dollars to get something like this off and running. Is this an option? I'm a foreign company. I want to get into the U.S. market. Uh, I've got lots of money to spend uh, on advertising my content. I've got a good brand. Start up an MVNO. I think it's a good way to lose a lot of money quickly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. That's, you know, sort of my jaundiced perspective. I mean, I think you have to find the right partners in the U.S., and I think they're...
that there are different groups within the carriers, but if you also look at who is really able to effectuate an off-deck strategy right now and who the smaller people I have as clients who are able to, the word partner is not really the right word, but able to work with the larger content providers, you know, Verizon wants to be in business with them, MTV. They may not like on the you know, data side that going out with an off-deck strategy, but the messaging people want it, so Verizon's going to say, okay, I can live with that. It's MTV. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go shoot MTV. And when the smaller content providers come from Southeast Asia or from, you know, we seem to, for whatever reason, have a lot of German and French clients, um, and they come to the U.S. and they, they, they have an idea of either sort of a true off-deck strategy because they see in the internet world you know, everybody with a YouTube play and they can't, can't they just do that and slide over here? You sort of say, no, it's probably better to go talk, you know, we don't have Spanish clients, very many Spanish clients or any, but it's always better to go and talk and try and partner with the MTV. Mm. Um, it's always, you know, if you have something really compelling, go work with them because if they like you and they have something that's worthwhile, they can take you into the carrier. Right. As part of their portfolio. Right. Now, what about let's um, let's let's turn let's reverse the equation now and let's look outwards a little bit. Um, Handango, you were saying earlier, um, it does about 25 percent of its business abroad, and you work primarily with smartphone types of content. And of course, American smartphones um, uh, have not done remarkably well abroad. I, that's probably an understatement, mm -hmm. uh, which would explain. Percentage. Why aren't you getting into Symbian and those types of operating systems? Well, some of it's just been that's not that's not been our background and our history. Um, mm -hmm. But but the other is it's not clear to us yet. Um, and we spend a lot of time looking at the data with with folks like Nokia, who obviously um, the largest Symbian platform. Um, and you know, while there is all the data suggests that there's a lot more uh, a higher percentage of media consumption and and application use that platform relative to other platforms. It does tend to skew to largely free or very inexpensive content and not the, not the content that we've sort of been in the market at mm. historically. So, mm -hmm. so um, I think we're still trying to figure out how we're successful in that space. Um, Is that perhaps telling you something free? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, so, and I think that's a trend that we're even starting to see a bit in the U.S. as the demographics and smartphones skew younger. Mm -hmm. So the Symbian demographics tend to globally skew younger than what we see in smartphone demographics overall. Mm -hmm. um, but that's been changing, obviously, with price points in smartphones dipping below $100 the past year. Mm -hmm. We're definitely seeing the demographics skew younger in those platforms. And sexier phones that are smartphones. Yeah. I was just looking at a new Nokia that... It's a pretty cool phone. The N95? Excuse me, not a Nokia. I keep getting this wrong. <laughs> Sony Ericsson will kill me. No, Sony Ericsson. Okay. Yeah, which was Yeah, a, no, yeah, great really, phones. Um, really cool smartphone. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, no free in your future. Uh, it's something that we are looking at. Um, we're obviously looking at lots of different business models about in our business and, uh, you know, advertising models and other ways to subsidize content are certain, certainly something that we're looking at. Okay. So, Chris, I would assume you know a lot about selling to Latin America. So, how's that business going for you? Uh, surprisingly, we, I mean, we're 100% of our assets are in the U.S. Um, we do sell uh, Mexico and Latin America. We have four music labels, which we bought, accounts for about 40% of the Latin market. Um, so, I mean, we, we have success. Our brand is known throughout Latin America. It's not, uh, it's not a brand like Televisa or Venevision, but it's, it's well known. So it gets us in the door and it gets us deck placement and it gets us up. We haven't branched out to Europe or Asia. Um, it's something we're going to be doing uh, in the near future with our content. And surprisingly, Latin content sells very well in other parts of the world. Hmm. Um, it's just been a sheer matter of resources on our end. And just now, how does that work? I mean, is the is it uh, dubbed, I assume, with other languages? No, I mean, no. Hmm. No, it's people, so Spanish, people that enjoy Latin content. Yeah, so, so well, music, sure. Uh, our partner in Mexico, Televisa, produces. I think it's more content than any other media company in the world, and they produce these telenovelas, which are soap operas, and they um, they export them all over the world. Those they 
yeah. um, but they're exported all over the world and they sell huge throughout Eastern Europe and parts of Asia and everywhere else. So, um, but with music, music's music and people are going to you know, like the music for what it is. And now with our video content, we'll see, uh, I don't know. I don't know the strategy behind that yet. We're still working on our strategy in the U.S. So, mm. How does that play on the mobile? Which, like what kind of content uh, sells the best in mobile? You're talking video? I'm just talking about anything. Well, mu I mean, it's still the, the top seller out there. Um, we when did you say music, are you saying, um, are you saying ringtones? Yeah. You, yeah primarily ring ringtones primarily in Latin ring America? Tones. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. Uh, what about this other stuff, uh, you know, downloadable music, streaming music, all that stuff? I think, I mean, I think you're going to see some success, successes with that kind of content, but for us, at least, it's been relatively new. I mean, uh, you know, our biggest success thus far was probably World Cup uh, video in the U.S. We did that with Verizon, and we had just this amount of um, response on that property, and of course, I mean, it's World Cup, you'd expect that, but... Um, I think we're seeing the same kind of, you know, the Hispanic market's probably the best demographic in the U.S. for, for mobile as it is. It's the youngest. It's uh, um, very, very, it over-indexes on all mobile devices, mobile content, mobile everything. So we have a great audience for the stuff that we're doing. And, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Jay, uh, tell us about what you're doing abroad. What, what kind of content is, is the best? I'm oh, sorry, sorry, is that again? What, what are you doing abroad? Um, I mean, basically, uh, you know, MBlox, uh, uh, you know, reaches out in, on a premium uh, capability for, you know, billing transactions across, uh, uh, I believe it's around 18 countries right now. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, uh, e again, each of those countries in some respect have their own individual um, areas of, you know, uh, of guidelines. Um, and, and it's funny, I'm going to go back to one thing is that, you know, we always say, you know, you know, the U.S. is behind or, or, or in, in these kind of, you know, conversations. But I, I believe really the U.S. is almost, I like to say, caught up in a lot of ways. Um, you know, we, we've been slow in regards to being more meticulous on how, you know, the carriers want to roll things out. Um, but, and, and if you look at it, you know, 3G was, you know, bumped up a lot quicker in Europe. Now we have our edge networks that are going on, the data. I think you see... You know, I, I think there's always going to be the business models and maybe the openness of the carriers in Europe to be a little more, uh, a little more aggressive uh, because it's more embedded into their, their, their societies and what they've done in their consumer market. Um, and I think the U.S. market in itself is going to actually start catching up. I, I do see that happening. It's just, uh, again, it's a meticulous side of it because it's a curious situation for the U.S. carriers to, to, to have to manage that whole Side that they want to make sure the experience is good. Okay. So, Dan, do you have any horror stories for people, uh, p Americans who've really blown it and trying to get their content abroad? A couple. Um, I think. I think the the first thing is if you're a small small player, um, find the right partners, whether it's a Univision or whomever. I mean, you're taking meetings all the time, and being being almost an aggregate of sorts. Find the right partner that's going to love your content and put you into their program and promote you. Um, understand, again, the value chain. Um, just because you might have, and I'll come back to it as a hypothetical purely, Paris Hilton doesn't mean that that's going to be something, a, a license to print money. Um, it's Paris, just as a matter of interest, is Paris Hilton even a commodity that would sell well abroad or no? Well, I think She's a commodity that, you know, sells well virtually worldwide, which is amazing. I mean, you know, and, and you have different celebrities like that and different, different types of properties. And I think understanding the sheer technological challenge to take a piece of video content or a, an application and actually see it up there either off deck or on deck so that someone can download and monetize it is something that on the content side when you're representing people in this city who want to jump into this area they they're sitting on a library of content and they want to monetize it and they they think that there are all these cell phones in China and you know if I can get 10 cents for every for every oh, how long page, have you heard that one I, you know and you you have to walk them through it um, I think just the sheer 
the, the cost of porting, the cost of, of getting it set up to, to, to actually go through certification. You must have one it. horror story. One. Um, we'll keep know, them anonymous. Would, Among friends. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, you know, the, 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 the single biggest horror story I have is that, you know, several years ago, some people approached us and they had probably some of the best access to content and talent in town. Um, you know, probably a couple million dollars. And um, they, because they didn't understand the barriers to entry overseas or here, I think they launched one piece of content. And I think if anything, they would have been better suited partnering with your company partnering with your company and an incremental approach. And I think you said one horror story, I think it's very easy to spend a lot of money quickly trying to bring your content to market. And I think even though you may say I'm only getting 10 cents on the dollar with this license to Univision, it may be a much more fast, rapid entry into the marketplace. Although there's the flip side of, it, of that, you know, that the famous story of the company, I can't remember, people always remind me of the name, but um, I think it was a Finnish company that bought the rights to Lord of the Rings uh, several years ago. That's the one everyone brings up. Ended up paying um, a couple million dollars or whatever it was to bring it, I think it was to only three Scandinavian countries, and quickly went completely bankrupt. Um, and there was a fear after that, I know when I visited Europe, that we don't want to deal with Hollywood because they're going to basically <laughs> they're going to shake out our pockets. Um, Chris, has that, has that changed as the market? Is Hollywood more savvy about um, building relationships as opposed to getting the last dime? <laughs> That's like a trick question. That's like the oxymoron. I, I, I should answer that for you. That's like the oxymoron. I mean, it's like every agent and every you know licensing person at every studio is going to try and get as much as they can off the table yeah. um i think what's changed is that the buy side whether you're you know a european game publisher which is one of the largest in the world the buy side has gotten a lot more sophisticated about what they will buy and won't buy from the us and what will translate as sort of universal content I think they're also getting a lot more sophisticated about what they want to bring into the U.S. and what will work here, and that they are looking for universal content. I mean, I think we have an unstable platform, and I think ultimately that makes it very, very hard for the content provider to have a viable, sustainable, monetizable revenue model. This is not like the DVD platform. This is not like the old video cassette platform. And it's not like the rising internet platform where you don't need that many standards, certifications, testings, just all this other stuff to get your content to market. And so I think both on the buy and sell side, they're getting more sophisticated. But I don't think Hollywood's ever going to change. <laughs> So I'd like to add a comment here, which is I've heard a lot of uh, comments here about, you know, how do smaller content providers um, get their content out or, you know, sell their stuff. Certainly the carrier deck is the main channel that, that everyone has right now, which is why this tension between should we use that or should we not use that. So what, I, what, I, what we feel is that the, what the market is missing is, is mechanisms that support, that make it more efficient for consumers to discover content, to discover applications. And that was a great example. Uh, it's a marketplace, right? When you go there, if you're, a, if you're a reasonably savvy user, you'll be able to find um, apps that make sense for you, depending on what you want to do on your platform and phone. So there needs to be more of that happening. Uh, you know, people invented all kinds of channels on the internet to sell their stuff, and it's very efficient. I mean, you can pretty much find anything you want to a Google search search and get, get where you want. I think more of those models, as they're born, they will support some of the, uh, uh, it, it's, it's interesting, very few people are actually working in, on that front, because it seems to be a status quo mentality, which is, um, you know, there are only so many channels, there are only these mechanisms to actually sell your stuff. Uh, but uh, I do think that more people will get into the, uh, to, into the market of trying to invent new models. Uh, much along the lines of Fandango, creating marketplaces or creating other, other capacities. That will then 
enable some of the <coughs> smaller content providers to uh, deliver content directly. Okay. Yeah. Did you have a comment? Yeah. So I, I mean, I think that's a great point. Um, I think one of the mistakes we often make I've, in a lot of these discussions is we spend a little too much time navel gazing. Um, I, and I don't want to overlook all the challenges of the ecosystem, but I think fundamentally it's clear now that you know consumers want control. Um, and that's, I think, one of the real challenges that we have in mobile today, that the ecosystem itself does not support consumer control. So consumers are saying they want control over how they consume media, when they consume media, um, and yet we're essentially restricting them largely to what the carriers have chosen should be the media they consume. Um, and I think, you know, we, we are not going to sort of see mobile take off uh, until we find a way to give consumers the control that they're, they're now expecting in their other channels. Okay, so let's take just a few questions. Uh, we're right at our deadline. Uh, for this panel, uh, and I want to go with a break again since that seems to be the will of the people. But why don't we take one uh, from our uh, Moses system up here and then um, one from the audience. So uh, who wants to go for the first one? I mean, this is, this is so important. It's been bouncing around for years. Where are we with the mobile, with the mobile wallet, m-commerce, that whole thing? The ability to just one click and buy. In the United States and abroad. Yeah. There's a lot of different what? There's a lot of different answers around that right now. Well, yeah, I mean, I think um, we're seeing a, a PayPal aggressively put forward a, a solution, um, and we're, you know, it, it seems like every one of my content companies is getting the PayPal deal uh, across their desk and and wringing their hands and head, trying to make sure that it actually works both legally and also on this level. So PayPal certainly is trying to promulgate a mobile solution, um, and I think it's coming. I'll turn it over. I, I mean, I think, I think you're going to start, or you're starting to see the, 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 the first steps in the, in the world of banking. I mean, you're starting to see a lot of the banks start trying to do a little bit more of a personal interaction uh, with their uh, mobile services, uh, you know, security side of things for fraud. I mean, you know, these are little baby steps right now uh, where the banks are all trying to get a comfort level of this whole new world of mobile because um, you know it's a it's an issue of security it's an issue of uh, consistency um, if you look at it right now I mean online banking is you know almost natural for most people now that are on the internet um, but it took a while to get there and I think you're starting to see some of these announcements that are happening you're starting to see visa get more active in this environment um, you know we see a lot of these type of businesses starting to develop. So um, how quick we're, we're going to be able to do it here in the U.S. to be able to, you know, click and buy, uh, I think it's going to be a while still. I think uh, your group is wild as that. Yeah, I'm on the, uh, the M-Commerce community of MMA, and we have some of the banks and some of the some retailers and some other folks that chime in on that topic. And it's as hot as it is in the trades, I think we're still quite a ways away. The carriers are trying to figure out how to handle the billing of non-digital and there's all kinds of FCC issues, and there's, you know, you've got several credit card companies that are active in the space, but it's going to take a lot of investment and a lot of time uh, before we get to something that's, uh, I think, uh, going to be effective for all of us. Okay. Very good. I want to leave time for personal questions to uh, the speakers up here, so why don't we give them a hand? Okay, so we'll take like two to three. Anyone has any questions for the speakers or wants to uh, exchange cards? Now's the time to do that. And in the meantime, can we have the next panel up here? And let's get ourselves situated and ready to go. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you. Jay, Joe. I know. That's how. Yeah. Dan. Michael Weiss. Yeah. <laughs> So the next panel, please. I'm a producer. We have Okay. We should talk. You can begin to take the networking outside if you need to, or move it over to the side. And again, if I can get the next panel and the moderator.